For me, I'll give you a really fast bit of background. I've been doing this really my whole career. I was in corporate America very briefly, uh, but it was just not a good fit for me. I always tell entrepreneurs, it's not right or wrong, it's just a DNA thing. Uh, everybody works wherever they're comfortable. For me, my DNA-wise, I was not good at organiza organizational behavior in the environment that I was in. Um, uh, but that's not really the reason I left. We're gonna talk about that. I left uh, to become an entrepreneur. Not, I didn't even know what the word was. I still can't even spell the word. I don't even know who thought of a fancy, hard to spell French word for one of the simplest jobs on the planet. Um, we're problem solvers. But I've been doing this a long time. I've been involved in eight startups. Uh, two were acquired. We've had a couple of acquisitions. We've had a couple of public offerings. We've had two uh, massive failures. I told somebody once that I wish I had just bought lawn chairs and lighter fluid because we could have just made a pile of money and lit it on fire and at least toasted marshmallows or something uh, versus the way that I did it. Um, and then I had two companies that are still going right now. Uh, so we'll see how those work out. So, you know, what this really means is every mistake you could ever make as an entrepreneur, we've made them three times. But it turns out along the way, we actually did a few things right. Uh, that we looked back later and said, hmm, that seems to have been what we should have done in the first place. So what I'm going to do with you guys now is I'm going to share sort of best practices. And along the way, uh, a few years ago, I finally sort of got the last company out of my system and I had made this commitment to giving back. Uh, and the idea for giving back was to spend time mentoring entrepreneurs. So in 2012, I said, I'm going to take a year and during this year, all I'm going to do for a year is go help other people achieve their dreams since I have received way more than my fair share of blessings. So I took off in 2012 with this idea that, like I said, I would just mentor entrepreneurs, but it's turned into a world tour. I wound up thinking, what if I go to every single continent and meet entrepreneurs in every continent and see what people are doing in as many countries as possible? And it wound up, I think, total. Well, when we looked at our footage from everything we've been filming over the last five years, We've, we've been in 100 countries. So all I've been doing is meeting people and looking at companies. What I'm gonna share with you is the best practices, what works and why does it work and what do those people do. But let's start with this. Entrepreneurship, there's this big sort of misleading myth. Entrepreneurship is about you do this so you can get rich. And unfortunately, media tends to glorify those stories like the, the Facebook movie, Social Network, where you know people sing about making money and things like that. The best entrepreneurs Here's in this process, in this time I've been taking, traveling around the world, meeting people and talking to people, I always study success. Whenever I meet someone who's been really successful, I ask all the questions that I can. And here's one of the most interesting things I noticed. The world's most successful people, when I asked them why they did it, the answer was never, I was just trying to make some money. Okay, they're driven by something much bigger. And so I want to make sure that people are thinking about entrepreneurship. The real cool part about being an entrepreneur is you get to design your life. Entrepreneurs design their own job, their own career, their own company. I remember one of my favorite days in one of our startups, we finally made enough money to get offices and the guys, we were going to gut a building and redo it. And the guy said, what do we do? I said, anything you want. This is our company. Let's just design the office that would make you the most productive. Regardless of what, write down everything you didn't like in the past. Write down what you would like. And let's just build this thing. Let's build something that makes sense. So entrepreneurs are people that want to design their own lives and design their own future. That's why I became an entrepreneur. It was never about the money. And it really starts then with goals or dreams. We had a discussion at lunch today. Uh, some, you know, one of the questions that came up was, how do you know when to sell your company, right? And the answer is, well, what did you build it for? What were you trying to achieve in the first place? I'm amazed at how frequently people are deep into their lives and don't really know why they're doing the thing that they're doing. So the best entrepreneurs I've noticed seem to be driven by some big dream, something that they really want to do, something really important to them that gets them up every morning. If all you care about is money, then in entrepreneurship, the days that you don't see any money coming, which is a lot, the days you wake up and no one's going to give you any money, and you're not making any money, and you don't see it, people that only care about money quit. People that have big dreams and something that gets them out of bed every day, those people never quit. So I always would write down, from the time I was a childhood, I wrote down my goals. I wrote down the list of the things I wanted to do with my life, and I would look at that list, I'm going to give you an example, and say, can I design a career that actually achieves my goals. Instead of people that say, you know, your dreams are these things you have to put aside because you got to go to work, got to pay the bills, right? So people give up. They stop having dreams because I have to have a job. And my, my point to you is entrepreneurs are people that figure out how to do both. So when I was a child, when I would have a bad day, 
I would, I would go to the, I had a globe, and I would spin the globe in my room, and I'd close my eyes, and I would point. And whatever, well, by the way, 75% of the country is ocean, so I had to keep re-spinning. However, <laughs> eventually, you would get a country. And then I would go over to Time to the Encyclopedia, and I would research that country, and I would climb in bed, close my eyes, and dream of faraway places, dream of being in some exotic country, some place I always wanted to go. So I wrote down on a sheet of paper one day that before I die, I want to visit 50 countries in my life. That's my dream, okay? And, and I have to tell you, one day I was sitting in my cubicle at my corporate job, my engineering job, and when I was, oh, actually, I went to go to the elevator, and on the elevator, I saw this guy I know, and I was like, Chris, you work here? And he's like, you work here? I said, how, how do we, this is one of my friends. How do we work in the same building, at the same company, we don't even know each other? And I said, I've never seen you here. And I said, where do you work? And he said, I work up on six. And I said, oh, I work on four. Four is engineering, six is marketing. I never go up there. I said, that's why I've never seen you. I never go to six. I work on the fourth floor. I went home that night. I was brushing my teeth. I saw that little thing I'd written. I'm telling you, write your dreams down and stick them somewhere so that they don't let years drift by, that you never look at them again. I looked at that sheet of paper. That sheet of paper said, visit 50 countries in my life. I said, seriously, I don't even visit the sixth floor, okay? <laughs> There's no part of my life that is ever going to 50 countries. So today, people ask me, hey Jeff, how'd you get in the travel industry? Well, gee, what a surprise that I designed a job where my job every day is to get on a plane and go to another country. I was packing to go to, I was telling the story earlier today, to go to the Netherlands, which is a country I always wanted to go to Holland. But I was going there to sign a contract with KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. My job was taking me to the things that I wanted to do. Entrepreneurs design careers around the things they care about. You get to take your dreams and design it into your job. These are just pictures I was recently in Brazil is the one that's in the upper left. In India, I was talking to kids in the upper right. Down the lower left was a recent Malaysia trip. And in the right, you can see the edge of the pyramids where I was standing in Egypt there. My job is to go to countries, all right? So write your dreams down. Give them a chance to come out and live. I won't spend a lot of time about this, uh, this but uh, when I was a child as well, I used to dream of making movies and doing music tours and concerts. So guess what I did later in my life? One day I said, I'm going to create a production company a content company. So we were blessed enough to do concerts with Elton John on that other pictures when I was on tour with NSYNC. Uh, that's Justin Timberlake right over my shoulder. This was a dream I had. The point is, as an entrepreneur, I said I could dream about it all day or I could just do it. So I literally created a music company and one day there I am out on tour living my dream. Entrepreneurs combine their dreams with their hard work and design lives that take them the places that they really want to go. The best entrepreneurs are also purpose driven. Uh, what does this mean? And, and I, I know some people in here, we talked about this at lunch. I already told this story, but I ask everybody that works with me or for me. I ask everybody, what is your dream? Tell me some dream you have that before you die, you have to achieve. So I was trying to hire this guy and I, his name, a guy named Chris also, and I asked him, what is your dream? And Chris grew up in an Airstream trailer in the cold part of Pennsylvania. And the trailer, they were so poor, the trailer was rusted and the snow came in the holes. And Chris would lay awake in the middle of the night. He only had his mom and his sister. And look at his mom and say, whatever it takes, someday before I die, I am going to buy my mom a house in Florida. So I went and printed this picture, which is a house in Florida, and I stuck it on the wall. And people said, what is that? And I said, it's the reason we come to work every day. One day, everybody was going home. I said, I'll see you guys in the morning. And they said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm building the porch outside Chris's mom's house. And it was dead silent in the building because everybody knew what the point was. There's a reason we come to work every day. Everybody in my company, there's a picture on everybody's cubicle of what their dream is. It's my job to build a career that helps them achieve that thing. I will tell you guys, which I didn't tell at lunch, one of the best days of my life was the day after we sold the company that we flew Chris's mom down to Florida to take her to this house. And it was a really funny story because she thought this was my house. So she said to her son, she was angry. You flew me to Florida to show me that your boss bought another house. Can I go home now? And she was mad, which is kind of the setup, right? And I said, I'll take you back to the airport in a minute, but you got to do me a favor. She said, I want to go home. I, you know, I know what she's thinking. She lives in this horrible trailer in the cold part of the country. This has been her dream her whole life. And now you get it and I don't. So I said, I'll take you to the airport if you do me one quick favor. And she said, what? And I said, I just want you to come down the hall and see my bedroom. 
And she said, okay, this is already weird enough, right? <laughs> I'm not going in your bedroom, just take me home. And we took her down there, and what we had done, when we opened the door, we had bought all new furniture for her in the front of the house. The only room we didn't do was we moved her exact bedroom furniture. So the moment his mom opened the door and saw the bedroom furniture, I'm gonna get emotional again, and turned to me and said, is this my house? And we said, yes, your son did this. I, it was one of the best days of my life. It's not even my mom and I was crying. Okay, I'm standing there crying, we're all hugging mom, right? We bought her a house. This is why we go to work every day. I turned to my team and said, let's get back to work and do this again for somebody else. People that are purpose-driven far outperform people that are doing it for the money. Find a reason to do what you do every way. Find a reason to work harder than everyone else and you will be more likely to succeed. Get engaged. I have, by the way, no idea what this picture means. It was really late and I was trying to find something on the internet about being engaged, so sorry. <laughs> If you're, in this, if you're in this picture, quit posting your stuff everywhere. Um, the, uh, but the concept is right, even though I couldn't find a good picture. Um, get engaged. People say to me sometimes, because we did the, uh, you know, we were on tour with, with, with Justin Timberlake. I, as Jeff said a minute ago, I found myself on the red carpet at the Grammys a couple months ago, winning a Grammy. We've gotten to do some really cool things. I'm on the way. I just came from Israel where I met with Israeli President Shimon Prez, and I'm literally leaving you guys flying straight to Moscow, and I'm meeting with the Russian Prime Minister. So there are some days that I get to do stuff that I'm really, really thankful for. I stand there and close my eyes and say a prayer of thanks because I'm really blessed to do this. But people say to me, you're so lucky. And here's the thing. First of all, they don't see the trail of blood, sweat, and tears that led to your luck. And people don't realize that the harder you work, the luckier you get. Okay? And the reason for that is that the people that are most engaged in the world around them have more chances to have luck, if you want to call it that. So what I'm going to tell you is be engaged in life. Meet people. If you come to an event like this and leave without meeting one person you didn't know when you walked in, you just missed an opportunity. That might have been your co-founder, your partner, your investor. It might have been your future boyfriend, girlfriend, or spouse. But not talking to someone because you don't know them is an opportunity missed. Go places and do things. Coming here today on a weekend is being engaged. You didn't have to be here today. You could be home on the weekend. The more places you go, the more things you do, the more people you meet, the more chances there are that something amazing happens to you in your life. Be engaged in the world around you because the best entrepreneurs are. And that's where some of the ideas come from. I always keep, I keep telling people all the time, I never get enough sleep. And year, year after every year of my life, I say, I'll just sleep when I get older. And I keep getting older and I keep not sleeping. Because it seems like there's always something else I could be doing besides that. I'm not advocating not sleeping. This is a bad idea. But what I'm saying is, the more engaged you are in the world, the more things happen to you and increases your odds. Solve real problems. This is a big one that I tell entrepreneurs a lot. Um, <clears throat> I do see, I get pitches all the time every week. And I have to tell you, I do see a lot of pitches that are just a solution that has no problem. I say it's cool, probably only you and your mother will ever see this product or like it, and she's lying, okay, um, <laughs> because you're her kid. Um, it, it's uh, the, the key to success. In fact, I have to tell you something. I wrote this also down long ago, and it's still on my wall, this wall where I write stuff that matters to me. And one of the things that I fundamentally believed was I wrote down, dream big, work hard, and create value. And I thought that if I lead a life of where I have big dreams and I don't let anybody talk me out of them or laugh me out of them, and I work as hard as my dreams are big, okay, and I go out in the world and create value, something someone cares about, the sky shouldn't even be the limit. The galaxy should. I should be able to have the life, that ever, whatever life I want. But part of it, the third one was, dreaming big and working hard aren't enough. I've had people that tell me, geez, I work so hard. Well, if working hard is, I go out there and dig a hole, move all the dirt over here, then I go over here and dig a hole and move all the dirt back, I'm working really hard, okay? But I'm not gonna achieve success because I'm not creating value in the world. So here's what entrepreneurs do that everybody else doesn't. They solve real problems when they see them. When you see a problem in your life, I'm gonna give you an example in a second. What most people do is they complain. How was your day? Horrible. I waited in that stupid line three and a half hours. Those people are so inefficient. But they go home. They complain and go home. Here's what entrepreneurs do. When entrepreneurs see a problem, they stop and they look around and they say, does this bother you guys too? And if everybody in the room says, yes, it bothers me too, then they go to the second question. Is there a solution and I just don't know about it? 
And if the answer is no, there is no solution to this, here's what entrepreneurs do that everybody else doesn't. They say, you guys go on without me, I'm not leaving here until this is fixed. Okay, so I'll tell you my two, the two first things I did in my first startup. I was 20 something years old. I don't know anything about entrepreneurship or money or funding or companies or anything, but I spotted problems in the world and that I could fix. So the first one, I was on the phone with a travel agent and that's what you had to do back then. And I called the travel agent and I asked, I said, uh, I need a three o'clock flight to New York. And she said, Delta has one at two and Delta has one at four. And I said, I need a three o'clock flight. And she said, there's a Delta at two and a Delta at four. And I said, ma'am, with all due respect, American has a flight at three. And there was a long pause and she goes, fine. And I was like, what do you mean fine? You weren't gonna tell me. And she's like, fine, what flight do you want? And I said, no, wait a minute. And I know why she didn't read me the American flight, because she was commission based. She wants me to make, buy the worst ticket for me, the thousand dollar one, I want the $300 one. So I started thinking, how do I know what this woman's reading me? Right, she has no, she, in fact, she's intended to make a bad decision on my behalf because she's commission based then. So I asked all my friends, does this bother you? And everyone said, yeah, we don't even know what we're getting what they're doing. And so I went and did some research. Is there any way I could book my own airline ticket? And at the time the answer was no, right? So our first product was, we built the world's first ever online booking technology. In fact, later I was involved in a deal we did with Bill Gates and Microsoft where we built Expedia um, in, in, a, in, a, in a joint project together. We saw a real problem that we solved. I'll tell you our second thing. I was standing in line at the airport an hour late and I waited, I was already late and the line took about 58 minutes to get to the front. When I got to the ticket counter, I gave the lady my driver's license, and the lady said, uh, she just looked at it and hit a button that said print and reached over and handed me a boarding pass. And I said, seriously? And I said, I stood here for an hour for you to hit print? And she said, sir, you can't get on a plane or through security without a boarding pass. I said, I know, but it's just a printer. And I said, just put it there, I'll print my own boarding pass. She said, you know, you can't do that. So I turned to all the people behind me and a live audience, and I said, am I the only one annoyed that it takes one hour to do something that any printer could do? Everybody groaned, and I was like, that's exactly what I wanted to hear right then, right? And then I did the research. Is there any way to print your own boarding pass? No. So guess what our second product was? We pat designed, patented, and started selling in airports all over the world those kiosks that people use today. Uh, when you go in an airport and you just grab your own boarding pass. Um, we saw problems in the world and we solved them. And again, I talked about this earlier to some of the people in here at lunch. I'm not a money person, it's not what drives me. But I will say this, I was 20 something years old, this was my first startup, okay? And we sold the entire company to a Fortune 500 company for about $100 million. Now that's not internet money, but when you're 20 something, that's not bad money either, okay? And I was never driven by money, but I was driven by solving problems passionately and creating value in the world. If I had gone to any person in that line an hour long and said, give me five bucks and I'll give you a boarding pass, everyone in line would have handed me $5. I created something that people cared about and were willing to pay for, and we were successful doing that. But there's a really big lesson here. If you write down only one thing or remember only one thing I tell you today, remember this. Don't chase money, chase excellence, okay? Money follows excellence. People that chase money don't win. People that chase excellence win. There is nothing, it drives me nuts today in Silicon Valley, for example, that you're just launching your company and someone asks you your exit strategy. And I think exit strategy, what's your entrance strategy? You don't even have a business. What are you exiting? People are two PowerPoints in and we're writing an exit strategy, seriously? There's nothing to sell in the world until you create excellence. And guess what the flip side of that is? When you create excellence, you never have to look for money because it shows up. Money follows excellence. I have spent all my time telling my people, quit worrying about an exit strategy, just build an amazing product. When we built amazing products in the world, everybody started ringing our doorbell and saying, we want to buy the whole thing. Chase excellence. Build excellence in the world and everything else will follow. In whatever you do in life, if you are the creator of the most excellent thing, you won't have to worry about the rest of this stuff. If you think about a company like Priceline, we never had to sell it. Uh, it's an excellent company that does really well and was really profitable and was never acquired. Uh, today it's a, uh, crazy it is, it's a $62 billion company that was started with a small group of people from scratch, like any startup you saw here today. But it was a company that created, delivered on a daily basis, excellence, and it never had to worry about anything else after that. That's probably the most important lesson. One of the other things that the world's most successful people do is this. Somebody said to me once, because we, again, we've been very blessed. The, the music business worked, the movie worked. 
um, we, uh, you know, we've been part of multiple startups that worked, and somebody said, how come you've got been lucky more than once? How come you have good ideas? So I started thinking about it, and people, I, I began studying a lot of, again, really, really smart or successful people. Recently, I've been very blessed, again, the people I've spent time with. I did an event recently with Richard Branson, and he wound up inviting me back to his private island. So an opportunity to talk to a marketing genius. Um, I've been doing, you know, there's just been, been a lot of interesting people recently. Uh, Steve Wynn, the guy that built Las Vegas. I recently spent a day with him. Every time I spend time with someone who has been successful at something, I try to observe what's different about them. What are they doing that everyone else isn't? And I'll tell you what it is. They harvest ideas. They explore worlds larger than their own. And let me tell you what that means. Most of us, let's say you're in the healthcare business. Do you know what you do all day long? Healthcare. What problems do you solve all day? Healthcare. If I said to you, hey, you want to go with me to the banking industry conference? You would say, Jeff, I'm in healthcare, right? No thanks. You wouldn't go to the bank conference. If I said to you, magazines, what trade magazines do you read? You read healthcare. If I asked you if you wanted to read Retail Mall Illustrated, you would say, Jeff, we're not in the mall business. We do healthcare. Here's the problem. All around you every day, people are creating amazingly brilliant things that you never see because they weren't created by the healthcare industry. So I came up with this technique uh, that I use. I just made this word up. It's just called info sponging. Doesn't mean anything. It's just my name for it. But let me explain to you the concept. The concept of info sponging is that once, I do this every morning, by the way. If you can't do it every morning for five minutes, 10 minutes, do it once a week. But here is the concept. For five minutes, 10 minutes every morning or once a week, you are not in the healthcare industry. Whatever your industry you're in, get out of it. You don't work in that industry for 10 minutes. You don't work for your company for 10 minutes. For 10 minutes, you are gonna go learn one new thing every day. Just a quick little thing. But here's the key, something you have no reason and no need to learn. I'm gonna explain how this works in just a minute here. You, what do I do? I follow my curiosity. When I do my info sponging in the morning, I just click on some article, no idea why I'm reading it, it caught my eye. But it's not healthcare. It's something out of my industry. When I'm done reading it, I write down one sentence. What did I learn? Okay, I'm gonna give you an example in a minute. And then if you think of that, each of these little things you learn, if you think of everyone as a puzzle piece, if I gave you a piece of a puzzle and I said, what is this puzzle? You'd say, I, get, I don't know, it's one piece of the puzzle. If I gave you two pieces, you don't know. Three pieces, you don't know. But if you collect a puzzle piece every day, one day you're gonna say, oh, I figured out what it is. I moved the pieces around. It's gonna be a castle in Ireland, okay? So what are we doing here? We're collecting puzzle pieces. While you sleep, the world moves very fast. Stuff happens every single day. When you wake up in the morning, take a glance at the world and see if somebody came up with an idea that you can use before anyone else sees it. That's what info sponging is about. Literally every day, after I write down this one thing that I learned, I look at my list of just stuff I learned and just stare at the puzzle pieces, move them around a little bit. Is there anything here? And I ask myself that question. What can I do today that I couldn't do yesterday? I think the reason we kept having innovative successes is we saw stuff before anyone else. And you know the great magic trick about how we saw it? We were looking. It actually is that simple. We were looking at the world around us to see what we could take advantage of before anybody else. Let me give you a quick example. In the upper left, it says distressed inventory. One day in my info sponging, I was reading a story about selling distressed inventory. I don't sell distressed inventory. I wasn't sure what it was. But what it explained to me was if I sell these clickers, right, and I sell, I have 100 of them, and I sell 95 of them, and then the new one comes in, I have five left over. I got to get rid of them. They're distressed. I didn't sell them in retail. But I can't just give them to customers for some discounted price because he just bought five of them at full price and then I give that, that to you, to the last two for half price. My best customer is very upset. You can't sell distressed inventory using the same pricing channels as you sell your full retail. That's all I wrote down. Didn't mean anything to me right then, except one of the other notes on my pad I'd written down another day, was another day I'd, I'd he's heard, see this news story and it was Peter Jennings on ABC News at the time. You know what he said? He said every single day, 600,000 airline seats fly around the United States empty. I thought, wow, that sounds like distressed inventory. I wonder if there's a relation between these two things. Another day I read a story on perishable commodities. Okay, the story was about how to sell fruit. 
I don't sell fruit. I'm not planning to sell fruit. If you see me on the side of the road selling fruit, please help. Okay? <laughs> um, obviously, something went wrong. Um, the, uh, I read the article anyway, because the point of info sponging is to teach yourself one new thing you're not sure why you're learning. I read this story about selling perishable commodities. I wrote down that perishable commodities require a different distribution system. The story was about selling bananas. And it was saying that, that, you know, the time limit you have. But here's what I remember thinking. I looked at that and I thought, hmm, I wonder what's more perishable than fruit. An airplane seat. From the time you close the door, a banana lasts five days. All the goods are spoiled when you seal the door of an airplane. All those goods are spoiled and you can no longer sell them. They're all even more perishable. You can, you're see, you can see where this is going. I literally remember a day that we were all sitting around a table in Connecticut, pushing puzzle pieces around, saying, what could you make? Well, I'll tell you what we could make. We could make a distressed inventory, perishable commodity distribution system on the internet that, like I told you, today is worth over $60 billion and would never have existed if a group of people wasn't constantly looking at things outside their bubble to see what they can make of them. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Learn something new that you don't need to know and then think about a way you might be able to apply it to the business that you're in. That's what info sponging is. Here's another tip for the world, for the most successful companies. Win a gold medal at one thing. Here's why I tell you that. So many entrepreneurs come up to me and they say, oh, I got all these good ideas, I got six good ideas. And I say, good, get rid of five of them and go do one. And they say, well, if I get, let five of them go, someone will steal them. And I say, well, if you do one six of six things, it doesn't matter if they steal them because you'll succeed at nothing. Okay? The best companies in the world find one thing and the best people to win a gold medal at. You cannot win six gold medals. Think about a girl that wins a gold medal in gymnastics. She does not come home, shoot free throws, then go on the tennis court, Right, then swim a few laps, then 10 minutes of gymnastics, and then television. That is not how you win a gold medal in gymnastics. She does gymnastics for eight hours a day until she wins her gold medal. Winning a gold medal at anything is hard. Winning a gold medal at six things is possible, is impossible. Pick something you can win a gold medal at. And let me give you some examples. And by the way, yes, people will steal your other five ideas. But if you do what we were just talking about a minute ago, info sponging, you'll have five more. You'll always have a steady flow of ideas. So you might shrug and say, mm, that was my idea, someone else took it. But they take it while you're over here on the gold medal stand having an amazing life because you won a gold medal at something. When you win a gold medal at anything, the world comes to you. Here's an example. And by the way, I love to do my research wherever I'm standing. I'm standing in line at a grocery store and there's kids in front of me. And I said, hey, you guys shop at Amazon? And these guys say, of course, everybody shops at Amazon. And I said, what do you buy at Amazon and what can, what can you buy there? And they said, everything. Amazon sells everything in the world. And I said, interesting. I said, can you buy a book on Amazon? And this is a quote from the young man in front of me. He said, books are lame, Amazon doesn't sell those. Okay? <laughs> I said, okay, you're wrong on both counts. Books are not lame. Amazon, in fact, does sell books. Kid goes, I don't think so. And they're like, they sell everything, but I don't think books are on there. I was like, okay, whatever. All right? But here's the thing. Back when all these internet companies were starting, there weren't very many of us in the internet industry. So everybody kind of knew each other. I talked to Pierre Omidar, he's the guy that started eBay. I would talk to Jeff Bezos when he was starting Amazon. Here's what I want to tell you. People say, well, Amazon sells everything. They didn't start that way. I will tell you what Jeff said at the beginning. Jeff said, I am going to be the best darn bookseller on the planet. They went out and they won a gold medal in books. When they won the gold medal in books, here's what you and I said. We said, wow, it was only a book, but that's the best company I've ever done business with online. What else you got? It's a pull strategy versus a push strategy. Today, you and I create a product and push it out there and hope someone likes it. If you win a gold medal at something, they pull you towards them. Everybody called and said, Amazon, sell me something else because I love doing business with you. I will show you another example of that. I also sometimes go on the speaking circuit with a guy named Tony Shea. This is Tony's company. Tony's company is Zappos. Tony's company today sells all kinds of products. It's a marketplace, for, especially for all kinds of women's products. But when they launched the company, I can tell you what he said. He said, we are going to be the best darn shoe seller on the planet. They won a gold medal in shoes. Everybody fell in love with them. Their customers said, I love buying shoes here. How about some earrings and handbag to accessorize those shoes? We pulled them towards them. Find one thing you can win a gold medal at and quit trying to be all things to all people because the world's greatest companies did not get that way by launching six things at once. If you were in an early stage or a growth stage, get rid of five ideas, win something. 
when you win something, everything, but it comes to you. You know, ours, I, a lot of people that I meet in a lot of places, I don't even have a name, I'm just that Priceline guy. But that's not an entirely horrible thing, right? Because what they think is, that's somebody that was part of a gold medal winning team. Those guys built excellence. They built something amazing. So when I say to people, why are you calling me? I don't know anything about your business. They say, well, you apparently know how to win gold medals. And that's interesting. So that's what you're trying to do is find something that you can win a gold medal in. Building a great team is, do I have that? Okay. Uh, is a really, really important piece of this thing. You are never as smart as you think you are. In fact, the worst thing that happens to some entrepreneurs or people in life is success because they see themselves on, <laughs> I was standing in the airport the other day and a guy was, the guy was, I was waiting to go through the line and a guy was looking up and looking down at me and looking up and looking down and I was, what are you doing? And I looked up and I was on CNN right then and I was standing under the TV camera, under the screens in CNN and the travel line was really long and what he concluded, he said, this is your fault. <laughs> and I said, wait, I have nothing to do with these lines. He said, all these people can afford tickets because of you and your stupid company. And so he's like yelling at me, but, but you know, just he was looking at me and he's like, you're, you're the one that ruined the travel industry and ever. You are never as significant or as important as you thought you were and you couldn't do it without your team. The team is everything. The best team wins. I learned that the true goal of a CEO slash founder slash leader is not to run the company. It's to go hire people smarter than you in every single area and then get out of the way. Okay, go man your position because you can't do all this stuff anyway. I've never met a CEO who says to me, oh, I have equal prowess and degrees in finance, marketing, and programming, right? No, you don't. My, guy, my, my programmers, my tech guys don't touch the books. They don't, balance, they don't do the balance sheet. And my accountant, in fact, doesn't write code. And my marketing person doesn't write legal contracts. We all have things that we're good at. Build your team from day one and start looking for those people because you only win when you are one player on a, on, on a really, really good team. In fact, the best thing is when you look around and everybody in your whole company is smarter than you, uh, you know you're going someplace then. Um, build a great team. This is an interesting one um, about getting out of your office. When I talk to entrepreneurs now, well, 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 let me put it to you this way. You, when you're building a product, where do we build products? In fact, I'll tell you what happened. I was on a TV show and it was other CEOs and the, the host, she said, the hostess said, when you hear a good idea, what's the first thing you do? And the other CEOs all said, I grab my team and I go in the conference room. And I said, I grab my keys and I go in the parking lot. And everybody's like, you grab your keys and you go to the parking lot. I want to tell you guys the story of, of how I learned to do that and why I do that. Okay. I was meeting with this old elderly gentleman and he was in the retail business and this guy built retail stores and his stores violated everything that everybody, the expert said was the way to build retail stores. So I said to him, everything you did, the experts said would fail and it worked. You did it anyway. I said, how did you know? And he said, oh, Jeff, easy. He said, this gentleman said to me, a farmer in a John Deere hat told me. And I said, okay, this is a story I have to hear. So we sat down to lunch and I said, tell me the story. And this gentleman said to me, Jeff, that's my office. Those are my employees. They're MBA students, they're MBAs, right? You need people like that to do supply chain logistics and, and financial planning. And he said, but here's the problem. He said, those are my employees, those are my customers. My customers are in overalls across town, across the tracks, in a little diner, eating apple pie, wearing a John Deere hat. So what's the problem? The problem is these people don't know these people. These people oop, don't even live near these people. They don't eat in the same restaurants. They don't shop at the same stores. So my question to you is this, how is a group of people like that, your employees, building a product to be used to a group of people like this? And I said to him, so what did you do? And this man said to me the following. He said, every other Friday, I would change clothes, drive across town, put on a John Deere hat, and sit in the diner and buy people apple pie. He said, they told me how to build my business. Well, I will tell you what's kind of interesting. The guy that I spent today with, the day with, this is him. His name's Sam Walton, his company was called Walmart. And I asked Sam, 
Everybody said you can't build big box retail in rural America. It will fail 100% guaranteed. He did it anyway and it worked. And my question to him was, how did you know? And his answer was by listening to the right people. So you know what I do? I schedule time out of my office. When we were building Priceline, our own employees would never have used the company, would never have used the product. Our own employees would have said, I'm not gonna do that. I wanna fly my airline with my frequent flyer. Um, we spent time when we were building those companies we went to places like, like Kmart and Walmart and talked to people and asked people, how would you, you, you literally we left our office, we went across town, we found our customer is the discount shopper that's waiting in Kmart at the time for the blue light to go off so they can knock over old ladies to save 60 cents. Those were not even my own employees. They would have never used the product. So we left our office and we hung out where they hung out and we chatted with them. And by the way, sometimes those are interesting moments. I, I can tell you a day I was in a grocery store and the lady I was talking to suddenly turned and ran away. And I was like, okay, <laughs> don't know what happened there. She came back with store security and a police officer. And she said, him, pointed at me and she said, that man is trying to get me to go on a trip to New York with him, okay? <laughs> and I said, ma'am, I didn't ask you to go to New York. I just asked you how you would get there if you wanted to go to New York. <laughs> and the police officer said, okay, that's even stranger. Just get out of the store, <laughs> all right? But we were hanging out where our customers were, asking them questions and trying to find out. And don't tell me, people say, I talk to my customers all the time. No, you don't. You talk to them in sales mode when you're trying to sell them something and all the dynamics are different. Or you talk to them in service mode when they call you and they needed something. The only way to find out how to build a product for a market is to get out of your office, go across the tracks, put on a John Deere hat and buy people apple pie. Hang out where they are and listen. There's no sales, there's no service, you're literally just hanging out. We sometimes just go buy pizza for people or something like that in a market that we're in to just hang out with them and listen. You can't build products for people you don't know and you can't build products for people that you are not. That's a really, really important lesson. Um, finding a mentor, I think I just have one, yeah, two more things I wanna share with you. Finding a mentor, is really, really important. And I gotta tell you guys, I'll, I'll do this, I'll make this quick, tell you a really quick story about mentorship. I had some business ideas, I had a corporate job, I didn't like the environment that I was in, so I quit. And the day that I quit, I got a call from the most, and by the way, I was telling friends I was gonna quit and telling them my entrepreneurial ideas, and everybody kept saying, you're a fool. You're an idiot, you're a fool, you're a dreamer. Don't quit that job, Jeff. You'll, you know, you're, you're gonna be begging all of us for food. Okay, everybody kept telling me that. So I quit anyway. And I went, uh, I got a call from the guy in our company, his name was Charles. And Charles was the highest ranking technical person in the whole company I worked for. And Charles was the smartest person I've ever met in my life. Charles was the person everyone in the whole company wanted to be. And Charles called me into his office and he said, I hear you're quitting. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, you're gonna become an entrepreneur with disdain. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, because you're smarter than me. I said, no, sir, I didn't say that. And he said, well, this company's good enough for me, but it's not good enough for you. I said, I never said that. And he said, this company's good enough for everyone else, but you're so smart, right? And I said, sir, I didn't say that. And he said, what are you gonna go? You're gonna go out and change an industry? Just mocking me. You know what's even worse? I was thinking maybe, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually thinking maybe we'll attack this travel thing and maybe we'll rewrite this industry. Um, last year, I was telling people at lunch, last year we got this big award at the White House uh, for having rewritten a couple of industries. But anyway, I didn't say a word when he asked me that. Uh, I didn't believe. He said, Jeff, he said, it doesn't matter anyway. And I said, why not? And he said, because you'll fail at everything you do. And I said, okay, why? And he said, there's three reasons that you will be a failure at everything you do in your life. And he said, take a seat. So I sat down and he said, I'm gonna tell you the three reasons you'll never succeed in anything. You will fail. And I said, okay, I don't know what to say. This is the, the, you know, the guy we all look up to. And he said, first, he said, you just don't have focus. And he said, sometimes I have to work on this one thing for three years. And, and at times you're handling a bunch of different things at once. He said, your inability to focus on one thing Right, and the fact that you like to do more than one thing at once sometimes. He said, you'll, you're absolutely gonna fail in business. This is the smartest person I know telling me that I'm the stupidest person he knows, okay? <laughs> then he said the second reason. He said, the second reason you will fail in anything you do in your life, he said, you're the most impatient guy I've ever met. He said, did your mother never tell you that patience is a virtue? 
And I remember thinking, yeah, for like 40 times a day, but I'm not giving him that, okay? <laughs> and he said, you're the most impatient person. He said, things just take time. You have to wait them out. You have to sit quietly and patiently for things to happen in the world, and you're incapable of doing that, so you will fail. You know, I remember thinking, there was for God knows what reason, a Louisville slugger in his office. And I felt like saying, can you just beat me with the bat and get it over with so I can leave? <laughs> right? I just want to go home. So he said, there's a third reason you'll never succeed in anything you do in life. And I said, what is that? And he said, because you have no respect for authority. You think you're smarter than people? You're going to try something. Obviously, it, would, it must not work because no one else tried that. You think, he said, people design industries and write the books. And you think you have a better way? And I was thinking, maybe, just give me a shot. But he said, your disrespect for authority is, is, and, and, is, is the third reason you'll fail. So I went home, and I'm about out of time, so I'm gonna make this fast. I went home, and I was depressed. The smartest person I know just beat me senseless, okay, and told me I was a failure and an idiot. And I turned the TV on, and on my television, there was a, I, there was a, a, a golfer on TV, and I don't golf, but he was standing there with a professional baseball player that I was a fan of. And the golfer, so I stopped. The golfer handed, took the club, put the ball down and drilled this 250 yard beautiful shot down the fairway. And then he handed the club to the baseball player and he said, you do it. The baseball player took this horrible swing and the ball went off to the right in the woods. And the golfer grabbed the club back and said, you're swinging the golf club like a baseball bat, you're a horrible golfer. And he took the club back and put the ball down and drilled another, he said, watch, I'll show you how to hit a golf ball. And he hit the ball way straight down the fairway again. And he gave the club to the baseball player. And he said, no, do it again. And he swung, the baseball, he swung the golf club. Another horrible swing, and the ball went off into the sand. And the golfer said, your golf swing is horrible. You are a horrible golfer, and you're doing everything wrong. And the baseball player said, with all due respect to golf, sir, he said, I'm a two-time National League MVP. I have two World Series rings. I'm leading the league in home runs, and I make $24 million a year playing baseball. He said, I'm perfectly good with the way I'm swinging the bat right now. Thank you. <laughs> and I sat bold upright, and I realized something. Everybody in my life is a golfer, and I want to play baseball. I don't want to be Charles. And then I started thinking, I love my father, but I actually don't want to be him either. I have ideas that no one around me. You know where we get advice from? We get advice from proximity, not relevance. You get advice from the people that are physically with you all day. They respond to your ideas. And I started thinking, all my advice comes from my proximity. And they're all golfers. Not one person I know knows anything about playing baseball. So you know what I did? I said, I got to find an entrepreneur. So here's my advice to you. Find somebody in the world who you want your life to be like, who you want to be like. It may not be, I've learned to say, that's nice, mom, and nod, even though I'm not actually listening anymore. Okay? She loves me and she's trying to help. But it turns out my mom's never built an internet company. Company, okay, she actually can't help me and whether she likes it or not is probably not that relevant if she's not that customer. So I just got to tell you, I, I wound up in my community. I found somebody that I really looked up to who I want my life to be a guy that I want to be like. And I called him and I finally got a meeting with this mentor, with this person. And we sat down and we chatted for a while. And at the end, he said the most amazing thing ever. He said, Jeff, you're going to be a really good entrepreneur. I said, why do you think that? And he said, I kid you not, three reasons. He said, first of all, he said, you're a brilliant multitasker and you'll need that in the early days. I said, oh really? Because yesterday I was out of focus, right? <laughs> and he said, your multitasking will help you until you can get people to do these things. And then he said, second, he said, you have this incredible natural drive. Go, 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 get it done. I said, interesting, because yesterday I was the most impatient person on the planet. That's not good for golf, but guess what? In baseball, it's a really good talent. Entrepreneurs need to keep driving now. You can't let a big company outperform you. You got to get it done. And then the third thing he actually said, which is what made my day, he said, and third, he said, you don't seem to be afraid of anything. And I said, interesting, because yesterday that was called disrespect for authority, just because I want to try new things. So what I'm telling you is find someone in the world somewhere that you want your life and your career to be like, and take the specific advice for your, for your entrepreneurship from that person, not necessarily from the person sitting next to you, if they are in fact not, uh, not a baseball player and you're trying to, I'm going to end on a last note here. And then uh, we'll stop, in the, since I'm already over, we won't do Q&A. I just want to say this. I want to tell you something about hard work, and I want to share a story that was really relevant with, for me. I, I, I see people a lot that, you know, now I get to do fun stuff, I guess. Uh, but the point is, I get to do fun stuff now because I worked really, really hard when it was time. When I go to colleges, I tell the kids about the number of nights my roomies 
right? And even afterwards, we're saying, hey, it's Friday night, party, let's go, right? And I would start to get up, and I'd say, you know what, you guys go on without me, because I made a commitment to finish this, and I'm going to finish this. And these guys would say, fine, you can sit here and have a boring life if you want, Jeff, and miss the parties. But I saw a poster. I was actually talking about this at a school, sorry, recently. And one of the kids said, so you're recommending that we just have a life where we never go to a party? And I said, not at all. But before I answered, another kid in the audience said, you don't get it. And they said, if you work really hard now, the whole rest of your life is the party. Okay, and I love that the kid, this isn't about parties, it's about paying dues. You earn your fun, you earn your success, and you earn your freedom. So let me end with this story. The guy in that picture is uh, one of my very close friends, Evander Holyfield. If you don't know him from this picture where he's knocking out Mike Tyson, you probably know that Mike Tyson came back and bit his ear off in the next fight. Evander was getting ready for a fight and he was training. Okay, and I was just spotting him before we headed to Vegas for the fight. And Evander was doing this exercise where he does 300 reps of this exercise with this huge weight suspended in midair that nobody else in the human race could do twice. If, you, if the rest of us tried it, Rachel, you might be able to, but the rest of the human race couldn't do this. Uh, we'd do two reps, we'd split in half, and they'd have to get two stretchers for us. So it's ridiculous that he does it 300 times. I was counting, and I said 299, 300. And Evander said, Jeff, was that 299 or was that 300? And I said, 300. And he said, was it 299 or 300? And I'm thinking, he does this every day, 300 times, this thing that no one in the human race can do, whatever. And I said, it was 300. And he looks at me again, and he goes all the way back down to the ground with his big weight and all those muscles rippling. And he said, I think it was only 299. As he was coming back up, I made this mistake. I rolled my eyes, like seriously? I rolled my eyes, and Evander said, Jeff. And I said, what? And he said, look at me. And I can tell you guys what I remember thinking. I remember thinking, well, that was a short life. <laughs> it's over now. And I looked at him, and what he said next literally has never left my, the, my heart, my blood. He said to me, the difference between 299 and 300 is the difference between heavyweight champion of the world and every other boxer. And then he got up, grabbed a towel, and walked out. I did not move for 10 minutes. I stood there with the goosebumps, not wanting to let this moment pass, wanting to feel that with every fiber of my body. Because here's the point. If 299 is good enough for you in your life today, what's good enough for you tomorrow? 298? What's good enough for you on Monday? 297? What's happening down the street? He's doing 300 and he's going to kick your butt. This is not a sports lesson. This is not a boxing lesson. This is a life lesson. You get nothing without putting in the hard work and working harder than anybody you know. I went back home. I went to my office and I wrote on the wall 299 with a red slash through it. No 299s. Okay, and by the way, I love it now. People all over the country and around the world send me photos of no 299 written somewhere in their room or their office now just saying that they get it. Here's what happened. The next night, I was writing a proposal. It was midnight and I was finished. The proposal was done and I looked at it and said, this is a good proposal. We will win this business. I want every entrepreneur in here to, to think about this. When you're doing your job and you finish it and you look at it and say, this is good work. We did really well. And I thought, We're gonna win, we'll win this business on this proposal. Then I got up to leave. As I'm walking out, I walked past my whiteboard where the no 299 was. And I stopped and I looked and I said, this is good, but is it my best? Is this 300? Did I come in here to do 300 and leave at 299 because it's good enough? And I looked at that 299 for another minute, took my shoes off, poured some coffee, and stayed till 4 a.m. I didn't leave until I had done the best work I could do on this project. The customer called and said something we'd never had a customer say before. She said, Jeff, not only did you win the business, but we did something we've never done in the history of our company. And I said, what's that? And she said, we told all our competitors, there's no decision here, you should just buy Jeff's product. She said, we sold three accounts to you, to our competitors, because the work is so amazingly better than everyone else that it'd just be a joke to go out there competitively and do it. The difference between 299 and 300 and everything you do every day in your startup, in your company, in your life, is the difference between winning a gold medal and being a champion at something and everybody else. Thank you guys very much for listening to me today.